In this week's news, debate over the religious identity of Australia's 12,000 Syrian refugees. Church groups lend a hand after devastating WA bushfires. And Pope Francis releases his debut rock record. This is In Focus Christian News and Current Affairs. Hi, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. I'm your host, Ken Kingston. And I'm Sibel Kute. Coming up over the next half hour, we'll unlock the mysteries of the ancient cuneiform script with Gary Webster. Trafford Fisher examines claims that puzzles and games can stop your brain from aging. And you're looking into discipleship, Kent. Yeah, that's right, Sibel. It seems discipleship is a bit of a buzzword in church circles lately, so I want to get to the bottom of exactly what it means. And who better to help us with that than Pastor Glenn Townend, who's the recently elected president of the Adventist Church in the South Pacific region. Wow, that's a lot to pack in. Let's get on with the news then. In the wake of terrorist attacks around the world, public opinion is hardening against Middle Eastern refugees, with questions being asked about their religious identity. The Australian government's pledge to accept 12,000 extra refugees from Syria has triggered a debate on whether the priority should be given to religious minorities, Christians, Yazidis, Jews and others. According to the Australian newspaper, church leaders are worried that vulnerable Christians will miss out on resettlement. They're avoiding registering as refugees in UNHCR camps because they're afraid of persecution from other asylum seekers. Australian government ministers have previously said they'll prioritise vulnerable minorities, but church leaders are worried that the government's commitment may be wavering. Catholic and Anglican churchmen in the UK are beginning to speak out reluctantly in favour of military action against Islamic State. According to Premier Christian Media, the head of the Catholic Church in England and Wales has said that airstrikes against IS are morally justifiable. While there is a duty on us to pray, and while there is a duty on us to stand together, there is also a duty that those who barbarically threaten other individuals have to be stopped. Even the legendary Vicar of Baghdad, Canon Andrew White, who until recently was ministering in Iraq and negotiating peace between various parties, has said that IS is evil and that the UK should send ground troops to stop them. Both church leaders urged the UK government to open the door to more refugees fleeing the conflict. Melbourne Anglican Bishop Philip Huggins says that one way to minimise the chances of a terrorist attack in Australia is to reduce the number of guns in the community. The call comes as London police are accepting guns from citizens under a two-week, no-questions-asked amnesty. According to Anglican News Service, Bishop Huggins says Australia's 1998 gun amnesty was immensely successful, but that the number of guns in the community has been steadily rising since then. Communities in Western Australia's Esperance region are in shock and mourning after a devastating bushfire destroyed homes and rural properties, leaving four people dead. More than 300 people were evacuated from the affected areas. Church volunteers worked together with emergency services to respond to the disaster, with the Adventist Development and Relief Agency coordinating emergency accommodation for the evacuees. With the ADRA team at Esperance, they worked really tirelessly. I'm really proud of them. They did a great job. Some of them actually lost part of their farms and they still managed to come in and help others in the community. They were great on the ground. They were great with the other agencies. You know, they just did a fantastic job. According to experts, this year's hot and dry El Nino climate pattern could leave more than 4 million people in Pacific nations without food or drinking water. Papua New Guinea has been particularly hard hit, with 24 people already dying from hunger as crops fail, or from drinking poor quality water taken from muddy, dwindling sources. According to The Guardian, other nations affected are the Solomon Islands, Fiji, Tonga 
and Vanuatu, which already suffered significant crop damage earlier this year in the most severe cyclone ever to hit the island nation. They're delivering water in Vanuatu, the Vanuatu government, to, um, to various provinces where they're really struggling because they had all their crops wiped out by Cyclone Pam, so they don't have much to eat. ADRA Australia and New Zealand have a, a, a Christmas appeal and both of them are going to focus on, uh, on the El Nino situation, the drought situation. A priest is in jail and four other people are facing criminal charges in a Vatican courtroom over their part in publicising sensitive documents. According to The Guardian, three of those charged work with the Vatican's commission focused on making economic reforms. They allegedly passed the documents to the two other accused, journalists, who wrote books detailing financial abuses within the Vatican. The journalists have been unrepentant about the charges, questioning the Vatican's lack of protection for journalist sources. It remains to be seen whether Italy will extradite the men to the Vatican if a custodial sentence is imposed. Vatican records of quite another type are also poised to go public, but this time it's Pope Francis's speeches set to a progressive rock soundtrack. It is the duty to be vigilant, not to allow the pressures, the temptations, and the sins of the ourselves or others to dull our sensibility to the beauty of holiness. The full album, which is being released this weekend, includes excerpts from speeches in four languages, set to music which incorporates elements of pop, rock and traditional styles, including Gregorian chant. The pre-released single, Wake Up, has clocked up hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube. Seventh-day Adventists have made healthcare a priority for more than 150 years, but the completion of a 25-storey hospital building in the Chinese territory of Hong Kong is being called a miracle. The 470-bed facility will be able to cater for 1,000 outpatients per day and is an expansion of a smaller Adventist hospital that has served Hong Kong residents since 1964. According to the Adventist Review, church leaders in Hong Kong are keen for the hospital to reflect the denomination's commitment to holistic health. Lifestyle change is high on the agenda. Inpatients will be served well-balanced vegetarian meals and will each receive a visit from a chaplain. And 20% of beds will be set aside for low-income patients referred from public hospitals. 68-year-old Ramon Veron is passionate about the Christian education his grandchildren are receiving and would like other children to have the same opportunity, but he says he doesn't have a lot of money. What he does have, though, is an 18-year-old bicycle. According to Adventist Review, Mr. Veron and his daughter are currently pedalling the length of Argentina, some 6,000 kilometres from the Bolivian border to the southern tip of South America. Their aim is to raise $400,000 so that a new primary school can be built in Escobar, a satellite city of Buenos Aires. An Adventist congregation in Escobar is fully behind the project. They've kicked off the fundraising and they say the land is waiting for building to begin. And that's this week's news. How many of us have a bike just sitting there in the garage, Kent? Oh, All yes. that potential waiting to be unleashed. Guilty, Your Honour. <laughs> what did God say to Moses? What do you have in your hand? It's a good place to start, isn't it? Absolutely. Stay with us. Adam Kavanagh and Gary Webster are back straight after the break with History in Focus. Travel back in time to ancient civilizations through this bi-monthly magazine, Archaeological Diggings. This month, Diggings looks at the Shroud of Turin, one of the most studied artifacts in history. But is it really Jesus as claimed? We explore how ancient Egyptians not just adored, but literally worshipped their pets. And we also bring you the latest news from the fascinating world of archaeology. Don't miss an issue. Subscribe online or ask for Archaeological Diggings at your local newsagent. Hi and welcome back to History in Focus where we're knocking the dust off the past. 
I'm here with Gary Webster, the editor at Archaeological Diggings. Gary, you've brought us another rock today. Plenty of rocks, eh? Plenty of rocks, mate. Plenty of rocks. What's so special about this one? Well, what's so special about this is actually the writing on it. And let me tell you about this. This is a cuneiform tablet, actually. Cuneiform, okay. You know, we, you go to Egypt was a massive civilization. But there was also the cradle of civilization, Mesopotamia, and lots of people used the cuneiform script. Now, when you go to places like, um, you know, Assyria or Babylon, yeah. Iraq, and so on, you you find these tablets. Now, it was actually we were actually able to find how to read this stuff from Iran. Okay. And Iran is one of the most spectacular places to visit. It's got some very old ruins from the Persian period, and so on. But uh, beautiful people, by the way. It looks beautiful, the picture. The people are beautiful as absolutely. well. Absolutely. I, I love the Iranians. They're very friendly, super friendly people. We well, see it's not something that you get on the news over here, is it? It, it, it is not, often. and it's a shame because they are just lovely people and they've got some tremendous things to see there. But here in Iran, uh, back uh, quite a few years ago now, was discovered the, the writing on the Behistun Cliffs. Now, they'd seen this, of course, for centuries. People came by this way and wrote these inscriptions. But yeah. what did it all mean? So you can come here today to, to Behistun, just in, in part of Iran, and uh, you can see this massive inscription that was put there by Darius I. OK, yeah. And, and we that, know that He's mentioned from, in the Bible, yeah, the of Bible. course. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting is they've got inscriptions here and they're written in three different languages. OK. And so a bit like the Rosetta Stone to the Egyptians, yeah. how to understand the hieroglyphic writing. This one in three different languages now may be a clue to understand all this cuneiform and stuff. And was it Greek, written. the common one again? Or what no, was the it common? was in, written in Arcadian, was written in Elamite and in Old Persian. Okay. Now, the Old Persian was really the key to this because they, they didn't really understand it, but it was easy to understand because it was alphabet and so on. Yeah. So they were able to work from that and understand that and work back and understand the cuneiform script from this tremendous... And uh, what kind of things did they find when they translated the... Well, the let me... Well, for, for example, they have thousands of these tablets oh. uh, and 20,000 tablet, clay tablets from one library of Ashurbanipal, a great Assyrian king. But some of so the things... So this was their... This is what they'd do, their, their little yeah. diary entries. This they'd is, go home and they'd chisel out... This is your letter. I send you a letter. Send you one of these things. <laughs> but what they, what, what many things they found, as far as the Bible is concerned, a lot of information. Take for example. Oh, by the way, it was Henry Rawlinson who, is, who worked on a lot of this. Yeah. But you take this script, this one in the middle here, this cuneiform. This is what we call the Gilgamesh epic. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I've, I've, that sounds familiar. It's yeah. something to do with Noah. Yes. Okay. To do with yeah. The flood. We didn't yeah. call him now. It was um, Utnapishtim. But that clay tablet reads almost like the story of the flood that you find in the Bible. And it's not the only one they've discovered as well. So it's, it helped people realise, hey, this is not some so fairy tale. Said, so this is, Gilgamesh was writing about the flood of this Noah. The same flood, no question. This okay. is the same flood. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting stuff, so isn't it? So it just helps us realise that, again, it's not a bunch of myths and legends. It's yeah. got historical accuracy. Yeah, and especially all the way back to the flood as well. Yeah, well, this one, well, it doesn't date back that far, but it's a story that's common to many yeah. people. It's clearly something happened. Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff, Gary. Thanks for that. We'll be back with more In Focus next. Welcome to Family In Focus. I'm Monica Galash. Trafford, I'm so excited. I just bought this new app and it's all about training your brain. And I tell you, I feel smarter already. <laughs> And you and many thousands. I know, but yeah. I, you know what? I did actually hear there's a debate going on about whether or not it's actually working, but I think it does work. I mean, it's like a muscle, right? You have to exercise it, use it or lose it, that kind of thing. That's the stuff we hear. And that I've, I've buy that. I've, I've bought that for a long time myself. I haven't done enough Sudoku, but you know, <laughs> I know people who do. It sounds good. What I'm interested in is just recently there was some research that raises a bit of a question on it. It's suggesting maybe not. Surely not. Maybe not. not. Yeah, let me check. Let me read to you. This was a joint statement released by over 70 of the world's neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists. You've got to believe them. Are 70. they about to tell me that I've wasted my money? <laughs> they suggest you may have. That's a scary thing. This is what they say. Uh, they virtually look, it, it, the jury is kind of out. They're saying that the brain research is still going. Okay. But what they do say is that perhaps the most pernicious claim, devoid of any scientifically credible evidence, is that brain games prevent or reverse Alzheimer's disease. 
Wow. So some of the, the, like you're saying, some of the evidence, or not not evidence, but some of the the claims and mm-hmm. and the books we see, and they, the, you know, this will help you avoid Alzheimer's. They're saying no, that's that's a furphy, that's snake oil, that's wrong. We okay. can't claim legitimacy on that. Right? Wow. So. Well, I think the message is, hey, look, we need to be a bit careful here. Let's not spend a fortune on this latest game or this whole book of, I mean, doing Sudoku is great. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's suggesting maybe the message that we're getting that we can avoid brain deterioration by going into games, or the evidence isn't quite so supportive, right? It doesn't seem to be saying that clearly. Mm-hmm. It seems the jury's still out. Um, as the, you know, you might become quicker at catching a bird in the game, computer game, but that won't help you walk up the stairs or invest your money wisely or remember the name of a former colleague you bump into. Oh. Right? That's a little Aren't bit you disappointing. disappointed? But yeah. it, it's, surely hey. it's not completely out of my control. Surely. No, well, look, I think the important thing is that we do what we need to do to sustain a good quality of life because that's what we want. We want a sharp brain, a good body. Okay. And the research is saying, well, we have a good diet, mm-hmm. we rest well and sleep well, we sustain great relationships and we do Sudoku. <laughs> we Just look after our brain. <laughs> yeah, We're going to hopefully have a good quality of life. So okay. we're not going to... It's The message is, I think, is we're not going to get... We can't guarantee that we're going to look after our brain just by doing these games mm-hmm. or something. It's a much broader issue. Okay. And we can't afford to get ripped off That's by true. buying into this idea that if I spend lots of money on these brain games, I'm going to be OK. That's under question. So let's watch this space, but I think we do need to see caring for our brain in a holistic way. We're caring for our total selves and hopefully have a good quality of life. I'll have to give that one a go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Trafford. You, Thanks for watching and we'll see you right after the break. Signs of the Times, a magazine for a world on the brink. And this month in Signs, who were the wise men who travelled miles to celebrate the Saviour's birth? What does Jesus' birth really mean for your life? We examine Jesus' bloodline and his time on earth. How you can enjoy the season's treats without feeling the guilt. All in this month's Signs of the Times. Subscribe to Signs this Christmas and change your life. Hi, welcome back. Well, first there was incarnational. I got that. I understood that. Then there was missional. I started to get a bit vague. Now we're talking about discipleship in church circles. And I'm now completely confused. So I've just gone right to the to the source. Uh, Pastor Glenn Townend, who uh, is the new South Pacific Division President for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So if you don't know Glenn, I, I don't know who does. <laughs> Discipleship, what's, what's it all about? Well, what's it all about? Well, Jesus, when he was here on earth, he had 12 disciples. Right, I've got that. Yep. And uh, they were the ones that followed Jesus mm-hmm. and Jesus chose them to develop them as followers. Mm-hmm. Um, and he spent a lot of time with them. Uh, more than with the crowds and um, but when he was with the crowds and when he was out healing and teaching it's his disciples that were with him learning looking watching seeing Mm -hmm. hearing Mm -hmm. and then he sent them out to do the same thing okay all right so uh, it's it's a good model to start with Jesus and his disciples I mean I, Mm -hmm. I live just near Lake Macquarie it's from north to south and from east to west, it's actually pretty much the same dimensions as the Sea of Galilee, the same distance from Sydney as Galilee was from Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. So should I, as a disciple, be leaving home and being homeless, wandering around you know, Lake Macquarie, following Jesus, living the way Jesus did, or, or am I missing the point in asking that question? Um, some people will choose to be a follower of Jesus that way. Mm-hmm. Because I think um, in today's world, it's about how do we connect mm-hmm. with God, uh, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, scriptures, nature, all of that listening to God, um, having him speak to us, particularly through through the word and through the church, mm-hmm. and then following what, what God asks us to do. Because each of us are gifted uniquely. Um, some are really good at service. Yeah. So 
Maybe a, a way to, to help me understand this is to, for you to explain what discipleship is not. Okay. You know, for, for, for example, you know, when I was a kid, um, they'd say, oh, we've got a colour television. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a way of telling us it's not like one of those old black and white jobs. Sure. You, you know what I mean? Or you see um, a snack food that says it's baked, not fried. So this mm -hmm. telling us baked is better than fried. So when we talk about discipleship, what what is discipleship not? You know, what is there a problem that that this emphasis on discipleship is trying to to overcome? Yeah, I think there is a is a challenge that we're trying to overcome, and that is the challenge of the back door and nurture. Okay. Um, when you say the back door, what you mean? People come in the front door and leave out the back and door. leave out the back yeah. door. Okay. And, and this revolving door almost exactly. Yeah. And our statistics are saying that you know we know how to. Uh, see people come in to the church, but mm -hmm. we're not the best at developing them um, once they're there, mm -hmm. nurturing, caring, and encouraging them in in ministry. Oh, okay, and that. okay. So, so let me get this straight. So, sometimes we, as churches, we focus a lot on evangelism. We mm -hmm. do these mm -hmm. big public events. We explain the Bible to people. We have Bible studies with people yes. to the point where they they say, "Yes, I'm happy to step over the line for Jesus to consider myself a Christian," and we say, "Great, yeah, it's done. You're in. There's your spot in the pew." sit there and we'll go and find someone else to evangelise. Is th and, and that person gets and neglected in the pew, is, is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, and we've, we've, done, we've done that. Now, mm. Adventism always has had a strong message, a strong, biblical, unique message. Mm -hmm. And in emphasising that, mm. we've made very good believers, mm -hmm. you know, intellectually behind what we teach and what's in Scripture. Mm -hmm. However, I guess we have missed a little bit on how to make believers followers, and mm. that's the discipleship connect. So, so believers as in intellectual mm -hmm. versus followers as in what, how you act out your sure. Christianity in, mm. in your everyday life. Mm. Okay, in, in what sort of areas are you talking about when you talk about being a follower? Give me some specifics. Well, connecting with God. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of disciplines. Disciples have disciplines or spiritual oh, right. habits yep. Yep. Um, in in how to connect with God. Mm -hmm. You know, through prayer, okay. uh, Bible reading, Bible study, meditation. Oh, um, right. So simple, basic stuff. Yeah. So rather than say, hey, you know, I understand how Daniel chapter seven, chapter eight, and chapter nine all interlock together, and I've got that all straight in my head. Mm -hmm. But I'm not which is great. Which, which is great. Mm. But I'm not spending any time devotionally strengthening my relationship with God. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So from that practical perspective, and then you know what it means to be part of church, mm -hmm. um, and connecting with you know Sabbath and and church life, mm -hmm. and then some kind of ministry and service. Okay, which, as you referred to before, finding your gifts mm -hmm. and. And okay, and fine. All right. So, in terms of connecting with your church, with your community, I guess, devotionally, right. mm -hmm. it's, so it's a holistic vision of being a Christian rather than just to focus on one area. Okay. So you've you've had some great success working in Western Australia, planting churches there. I mm -hmm. understand you've been in Fiji, you know, in mm -hmm. that sort of developing world context. Um, in your, your travels and your work there, can you give me some examples of maybe a congregation that is doing this you know, really well? For example, in, in Perth, uh, there was um, some Adventists living in a street, um, connecting with their, their neighbours and mm -hmm. discovered that the local school um, had some real issues with discipline. Mm -hmm. um, they went to the school and said, hey, I've got a a desire to, to help, mm. how about we run a breakfast club? Mm -hmm. And so once a week they provided breakfast. Mm -hmm. What what happened was out of, out of that, um, the school said, that's the day we have the least discipline problems. Yeah. Can you do it another day? And so they did it a, another day. And then they involved parents and people from the school Mm -hmm. And then they said, hey, you're really changing our kids. This is the, mm -hmm. you know, the principal, the teachers, the parents. What else do you offer? 
So what, what the, the full bellies plus what the positive contact that they were having yep. with the kids, it was just made all the difference? It made a, a huge okay. difference. Yep. And out of that began other ministry and some of the parents and children said, hey, we want to be a part of your church. And then they were already involved in ministry. Mm. And uh, out of that ministry, a whole church developed. Wow. Okay. So they... Yeah, that's incredible because a, a disciple is in the end a disciple maker. I've, I've heard that Absolutely. said a few times. Yeah. And I guess. And, yeah. and you see, you can actually learn to follow Jesus before you actually fully believe in him. And that was what was happening mm -hmm. um, there. Uh, in, in Fiji, I um, have, have seen uh, Fijians give up their time. Uh, and start spending more time in prayer mm -hmm. and then say, hearing God say, hey, I want you to minister to the Fijian Indians mm -hmm. and go and, and visit and support them yeah. or go to prison and, uh, and have pris prison ministry. And out of that, there's been growth in them, people mm. that they've got to join them. And then when they're in the prisons or in the Indian communities, we're seeing faith develop there, there uh, and the the two things that I've uh, across the board that I've seen, it's a really close connection with God. Mm -hmm. So the disciplines of prayer, Bible reading, and all of that become real. Mm. And then secondly, there's a, a call to go and do something. Yeah, whatever ministry or passion or giftedness that they have, they're the two things that that I've seen really make discipleship work. Boy, that's incredible. So, so discipleship is about a holistic faith mm -hmm. that is not only intellectual, but also devotional and spiritual and also practical. Mm. But I think I'm a bit clearer on that now. <laughs> hey, thanks so much. I really appreciate your time, Glenn, and thanks so much for coming in. No problem. We'll be back straight after the break. Planning your future can be a daunting task. What you want to do, who you want to be, and the road ahead can often be unpredictable. No one really knows what the future holds. That's just part of what makes it all so amazing. And that's why a great education matters. Because it doesn't just help you get a great job. It helps you prepare for what life can throw at you and live a great life. Avondale. It's education designed for life. Hello, hey, thanks for your company this week. We hope you discovered something that encouraged you to take another step forward in your journey of life and faith. Yes, and it certainly was quite an educational episode this week, wasn't it, Kent? Yeah, I think you've got that right. Don't forget, all our videos are online for you to watch again or to share with a friend. The best place to start is at our website, record.net.au. Check it out. Until next week, all the best and God bless. Goodbye. Thank you.